That scripture that we just read is, uh, is a prophecy from the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, the Lord was speaking to the nation of Israel. There's a number of things going on there, right? God is seeing the, the religious leaders that were leading the nation of Israel at that time. And, and they were supposed to be shepherding the people of Israel, and yet they weren't. They were doing everything for themselves, And so then God jumps in and he says, I myself, I am going to shepherd my people. I am going to be the shepherd that they need. And then right at the very end, he refers to one. He says, David is going to come and shepherd my people, which is which is an interesting statement because David was already dead. (laughs) <laughs> By the time he writes this, David's already dead. So, so is David coming back to life? Or is the prophet referring to something else? The people of Israel knew that what he was referring to was this messianic figure. A Messiah was going to come, an anointed one, another shepherd, another king in the likeness of David who was going to shepherd Israel. And it's in this setting that... This scripture was read kind of in between or during the Feast of Tabernacles, which happened in the fall, and Hanukkah. Okay, so the nation of Israel would celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and they'd read portions of this scripture during the Feast of Tabernacles. And then during Hanukkah, they would read the rest of Ezekiel 34. We didn't read it all of, for all of you today, but if you want to go home and read all of Ezekiel 34, I'd encourage you to do that. And it's in the midst of this that Jesus shows up. Jesus, in John chapter 9, John chapter 10, Jesus shows up in this scenario, the Feast of Tabernacles, Hanukkah, which follows right after that. And he starts speaking about him being the shepherd. Him being the shepherd. In fact, he uses this word, I am, a couple of weeks ago, I gave you the background to that, that, that this word I am was a trigger word for the people of Israel because that would take them back to the story of Exodus. The story of Moses being out in the desert all by himself. His people, the Hebrew people, are in slavery in Egypt. God reveals himself to Moses in the form of a burning bush. And he sends Moses... To Egypt to set his people free. And as he's trying to figure this out in his mind, he asks God, who are you? Who do I say that you are? What is your name? I need to have a name. And God says to him, I am. I am the I am. And when we walk through the book of John, there's several times where Jesus says, I am. John is writing this on purpose. He knows that his Jewish audience is going to recognize exactly what Jesus is saying. Who is this God? Who is this God who rescued Israel out of slavery? When you walk through the Old Testament, God reveals himself in many ways. Hagar, you are the God who sees me. Abraham, you are the God who provides. Now Jesus shows up on the scene and he starts proclaiming, I am. A couple weeks ago, he says, I am the bread of life. Last week, Pastor Phil talked about, I am the light of the world. And now we get to another, I am. But before we get there, we're looking at John chapter 9 because this is the setting of what has happened. Jesus is there, and it's a Sabbath. And he's in the temple, and he sees someone who has been born blind, and he heals him. And all of a sudden, this blind man can see for the very first time. And he's jumping and praising God, and he's excited he can finally see. But people... Some people are not so excited with this man. They're not so excited with everybody else. These are the religious leaders of the time. They're not excited because Jesus has done it on the Sabbath. And in their minds, he is breaking the rules. He's working 
on a day that you're not supposed to work, even though it's something good, it's freeing somebody, it's giving something beautiful to somebody, all they can see is that Jesus has broken the rules in their mind and they are unhappy. All they care about is the rules and themselves. And in many ways, they reflect these shepherds that are talked about in Ezekiel 34. And in John chapter 9, Jesus says this, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. They're all angry. And Jesus is sticking it to them now. And he says, I have come into the world to bring judgment, to render judgment. He's rendering judgment against these religious leaders. He's saying to them, you are these shepherds that aren't taking care of the sheep. You think that you can see, but in reality that you are blind. And I've come for those who know that they are blind. I've come for the blind so that they can see. You know what, when I read this this week, it, it just really came to me. You know, we live in a world today where everybody thinks that they can see. All you have to do is, is hop onto social media, and, and we all have extremely strong opinions. In the midst of us having extremely strong opinions that we're not willing to budge on, we end up missing out on the grace that Jesus wants us to have for people. They were, these religious leaders were so rigid on their opinions, they had no grace for this man who was blind his whole life and now he could see. We run the risk in our world today of having so strong opinions that we miss out on having grace for one another. Grace needs to be greater than whatever opinion we have. Now, let's jump into John chapter 10. It says this in verse 1. It says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Robbers, thieves. He's referring to these religious leaders. He's not referring to them anymore as bad shepherds. He's referring to them as robbers and thieves. They're not legitimate shepherds. We're going to get into more of that later, but I'm going to continue on. I think the main core of those first five verses is about the voice of the shepherd. The voice of the shepherd. If you know anything about sheep, sheep know the voice of their shepherd and they're able to pick it out amongst anybody else's voice. In fact, shepherds often lead a very lonely life. They take their sheep up onto the hillsides, and they're, they're out, and they're by themselves. And so every so often, shepherds were, will gather together, and they'll gather their sheep together, and they'll have maybe three or four different flocks of sheep, and they're all spending, the sheep are spending time together, and then the shepherds get to hang out. They get to hang out. They get to have companionship with someone like them. But the time comes for the shepherd to leave. How do they know whose sheep are whose? How do they separate all of the sheep? Well, from what I've read, and I'm not a shepherd, is that the shepherds will go off into different corners of the field. One will go to that corner. One will go to that corner. And the shepherd, one shepherd will start calling out his sheep. And the sheep that are his will come to him. And then once he does that, the next shepherd calls his sheep, and the sheep follow that shepherd. And one by one by one, all the sheep separate, and they go to the shepherd that owns them. All they need to do is hear the shepherd's voice. I, 
I grabbed a video I wanted to show to you today. Do you have that? Can you show that to everybody today? So the shepherd, he's telling those people, These are, this is what you need to say. And they go and they say it, but the sheep aren't listening to him. But the moment the shepherd comes up, he starts saying it. Notice that it takes a little bit for the sheep to like perk up their ears. They don't come running right away. But the more he calls out their ears, they start looking around. Where is that coming from? And they eventually come to their shepherd. It's fascinating. The shepherd calls the sheep, they hear him. They notice his voice. Jesus is our shepherd. He, as we get through, through this verse, we're gonna notice he says, I am the shepherd. Do we notice Jesus' voice? Do we recognize his voice? Do you notice that in this verse that we just read as well, it says that he calls them and that they follow him because they know his voice. The shepherd doesn't herd the sheep. He calls the sheep and they follow him. Do you know that Jesus is calling you? And if you are his sheep, he's not there with a stick to whack you on the butt and to herd you. He's not herding you. He's calling you. And if you recognize his voice, you will follow him. And that's what he wants. He says, come and follow me. Jesus is the good shepherd. He's not a herder. He's not whacking you. He's calling you. He's inviting you to follow him. It's very, very different. In verse 6, it says this. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. I'm going to stop there. This is, an, this is an important verse. They didn't understand what he meant. You know, throughout Jesus' teaching, he taught a lot of things, and a lot of the time he would teach things, and people would be like, what in the world did that mean? In fact, his disciples would do that. And, they, and then Jesus would take them aside afterwards, and he'd give them a download. He'd give them the inside scoop. People were constantly trying to figure out what Jesus meant. But he would say, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. He knew that for those who are hungry, that they would seek after the meaning of what he had to say. They would continue to follow him. They'd continue to dig deeper. They'd continue to want. You know, in, to our today, in our day and age today, what we want is we want things to be really easy. 
We want everything to be easy. When we open up the Bible, we want it to be really easy. What does this have to say to me? How does it apply to me? And sometimes when we open up the Bible and we read it, we get discouraged. Because at first reading, at first digging, we, maybe we, you're confused. You don't know what's going on. You don't how, know how to interpret it. You know, that's okay. That's okay. You live 2,000 years after Jesus. You have to dig a little bit. You're going to have to seek after it. You're going to have to do a little bit of work to understand what he's saying. And that is okay. His original followers had to do that. And they lived in the same time and culture as Jesus. And they still didn't even know 100% what he had to say. Don't be discouraged. When you're opening up the Bible and you're reading it and it, you're not totally sure what it means, continue to seek. If you seek, you will find. He wants you to understand what he has to say to you. But it's not always going to come easy. John chapter 10, verse 7. Let's continue. It says, so he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely, and I will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them rich and satisfying life. In other versions, it would say, I came that they might have life and life abundantly. Here, Jesus uses another I am statement. He says, I am the gate. I am the gate. Oftentimes, as they would be out in pastures, there would be a sheep fold. And at night, they would bring the sheep from the pasture into a sheep fold. Then a sheep fold, if we can throw that picture up there, a sheep fold would oftentimes look at this. It would be made of rock. It would be a structure, a permanent structure made of rock. And there would be one gate. And Jesus is saying, I want you to be safe. Come into the sheep fold. But you need to come in through me. If you're going to be safe, come in through me. I am the gate. I am the gate. The gate represents safety at night. It re represents safety from dangers. To find that safe place, you pass through the gate into the sheep, into the sheep pen. Jesus is our entry point into safety. I want you to notice that this picture, there is not multiple gates. There is not multiple gates. Jesus would not completely fit within our culture today because our culture does say there are multiple gates. Our culture does say today there's multiple ways of getting into the sheep pen. Jesus is saying those who go over the wall, who crawl in, they're not true sheep. I mean, they're not true shepherds. They're thieves. They're robbers. There are those in our world today, they want to disguise themselves as shepherds. And they're saying, I am the way. But the reality is that they're just thieves. They're just robbers. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the gate. Jesus is incredibly inclusive. If you are a follower of Jesus, you end up choosing the gate of Jesus, which means that you actually end up excluding all other gates. And in the world that we live in today, sometimes you're going to be looked at as being like, you're so close-minded. And there's all sorts of names that we can throw out at people when they say, no, there's only one way to safety. There's only one way to God. But Jesus, he's the one who's exclusive, unfortunately. He's the one. He says, I am the gate. He's the one who says that. For me, I trust Jesus. Jesus, if you're telling me that you are the gate, I'm going to trust in that. The way to know God, the way to safety is through Jesus. In, this, in these verses, Jesus is comparing two different things. He's saying, there are those who are going to come and they're going to steal, they're going to kill, and they're going to destroy. 
I have come to give you abundant life. I've come to give you a satisfying life. These, these people who are going to come, maybe they're religious leaders, they're only in it for themselves. They're hoping to steal the sheep for their own purposes. They're hoping to make a quick buck. It is about them. But a true shepherd is what is best for the sheep. They do what's best for the sheep. They put their lives on the line for the sheep. They want abundant life for the sheep. This abundance, this satisfying life that that the shepherd wants for the sheep, that God wants for you, it's not just about the life to come, but it's for right now. When Jesus says that he wants to give you a satisfying life, it's for right now. Look at Psalm 23. If you know Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. It says, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Don't you love that word picture? This is the voice of Jesus. You can say, Jesus, you are my shepherd. And when we have Jesus as our shepherd, he gives us everything that we need. This isn't just about the life to come. This isn't about getting to heaven. This is about right now. Jesus wants to give you everything that you need. It's not about everything that you want. But it's about everything that you need. And he wants you to have an abundant life. Listen to this. He's like, he lets me rest in green meadows. Green meadows is where all the sheep want to be. Green meadows is that all-you-can-eat buffet for them. There's all the food that they could ever want in those green meadows. And when they have what they need, they find a place of rest. He leads me beside peaceful streams. The sheep are looking for water. But if the sheep go to a fast moving river, there's danger of them falling in and being swept down. So the shepherd brings them to quiet waters, safe waters where they can get it and be safe. That's where Jesus wants to take you to. He's going to take you to a place That's safe to get what you need. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths. If you hear the voice of the shepherd, if you hear the voice of Jesus, he's going to guide you along the right path. And when we do this, it brings honor to the name of Jesus. Jesus says, I've come to give you abundant life. All these religious leaders ahead of me, they came to steal and kill and destroy, but I want something greater for you. There are so many voices in our world, folks. So many voices in our world that are competing with the offer offer of Jesus, saying, listen to my voice, follow me, I have the truth. There are voices that don't go through the gate of Jesus. Jesus. Who is telling the truth? Who can you trust? Are you listening to the voice of the shepherd? Are you listening to Jesus? You can be one of Jesus' sheep and you're listening to other voices more than you're listening to the voice of Jesus. Do you know his voice? Are you listening to it? In the world, there's so many competing voices. If you are a sheep of Jesus, is that a label that you place on yourself, but in reality you have ears for other shepherds? Or is it more than a label? Are you following him? Are you intently listening to what he has to say to you? Verse 11 says this. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. 
A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. Jesus, he shows up on the scene. He says, you've experienced all sorts of wicked shepherds, but I want you to know that I am the good shepherd. I lay my life down for the sheep. Verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. That picture that we showed up earlier, can you throw that up again? Know what a shepherd would do at night? He would bring the sheep into that sheep pen. How does he make sure that there's no wolves that are going to get in? How does he know that there's no wild animals that are going to get in and eat the sheep? You know what the shepherd does? He lays down in front of that gate. If you're going to get to my sheep, you got to go through me. If you're going to get to my sheep, you got to go through me. That's what Jesus says about his sheep. That's what he says about you. He lays his life down for the sheep. That's what Jesus did when he died on the cross for our sins. He saw a world that was dying in sin. And he laid himself down at the entryway as all the wolves came to eat the sheep. He laid his life down and sacrificed himself for us. It reminds me of King David. Remember the story of David before he was king? He was a shepherd, right? He was the youngest of all these brothers. And he's a shepherd and he's out. And there's all these, these little stories of, of, uh, of a bear comes to eat the sheep. And what, is, what does David do? He doesn't run away. He gets out his sling. Can you imagine trying to fight a bear with a sling? And he fights the bear and he kills it. And there's one another about a lion. He kills a lion. He protects the sheep from the lion. This is the messianic example of Jesus. This is Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus is pointing towards David. And he says, remember those stories of David? That is me. That is me. comes out of Ezekiel 34, verse 23, where it says, I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David. That is Jesus. Jesus compares the shepherd, these shepherds with uh, thieves and robbers. He also compares it with hired hands. There's these two different competing groups, one that you hire, but they run away When the wolves come, they run away when the lions come. Why? Because they're all in it just for the money. The thieves and the robbers are the same thing. They're all in it for the money. We get discouraged in our Christian walk. We get discouraged in Christianity because of these hired hands. When we look at these hired hands, maybe maybe you're reminded of, of pastors televangelists, people who, when it all comes out, when the truth comes out, we recognize that they were just all in it for themselves. They got rich off of their ministry. And we find out what was going on in their personal lives, and it didn't match up with their public lives. And we get discouraged over that. But we need to know that these hired hands that have come along the way throughout Christian history, they don't represent Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. These hired hands, they fail all the time. But Jesus doesn't fail. He lays his life down for you. And there's all sorts of hired hands out there. You know, we live in a day and age where we're putting our faith In different political ideals, we put our faith in politicians that we think are going to save us. We put our faith into, into influencers on the internet. But Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and they know me. I know my own sheep and they know me. 
This is about close relationship with our shepherd. Jesus wants to have a close relationship with you so that you really recognize his voice. Verse 16 says, I have other sheep too. They are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. It's an interesting verse. What is is Jesus talking about? I have other sheep from other sheepfolds. I need to bring them in as well. Most people think that Jesus was talking about, because he spent most of his time with Jews, that Jesus was talking about all the Gentiles that were going to come into the kingdom of God. I want you to open up your mind, guys. He's talking to, these, he's talking to his Jewish followers. I want you to open up your mind. I have other sheep. There are other sheepfolds. You're going to think that they're not a part of us, but they're going to come in. It's going to upset the fruit basket. You're not going to like it, but you need to accept them. We don't struggle with this so much today, Jew, Gentile, whatever. But there's an aspect within the church. I think that we, just, we struggle with that in terms of other denominations, other churches, other ways of expressing our faith in Jesus. I think if Jesus were to walk in to Gateway today, he would say, I have other sheepfolds. You're a part of one big sheepfold. Those other churches down the way that you have differences with, that you do things different, they're part of my sheepfold as well. I'm guiding them and I'm directing them. And so we need to be ecumenical in thought, that idea of opening our minds and recognizing of what binds us together than what separates us. What is the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Verse 17 to 18, this is the last scripture. It says this. The father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is what my father has commanded You know what? Jesus' death on the cross wasn't an oops. It wasn't the fact that the Roman army was stronger. It wasn't the fact that the religious leaders were stronger than him. Jesus willingly laid it down. He laid his life down. He laid it down for you and for me. And that's what Easter is about. And that's what we're looking forward to in celebrating Easter during the season of Lent is recognizing Jesus, the good shepherd, laying down his life for us. And he did it on purpose. And just as easily as he laid his life down for us, and he chose that, he also took it back again. He says, I'm not staying there. Death isn't the end for me. I'm going to die. And I'm going to be in the grave But I'm coming back again, folks. There's an end to this story that doesn't end with my death. It ends with my victory over death. And he did it not to show off. Jesus wasn't like, hey, look at me. Look what I can do. I can die and come back to life again. No, he sacrificed his life as that good shepherd. He put himself at the entryway of the gate as the wolves came because he loved us. He did it not because he wanted to, and we see that as as his last night, as he says, Lord, would you take this cup from me, but not your will, not my will, but yours be done. Who is your shepherd? Who is your shepherd? And if Jesus is your shepherd, do you recognize his voice? We have to fight you guys to hear his voice more than ever before because his voice can be drowned out by so many other voices that are in our world today. But if you are intent on hearing the voice of the shepherd, you will find it. And it'll become loud and clear to you. His voice will become louder than any other voice in this world. 
Why don't you close your eyes in prayer with me? Maybe you're here in this place today and you haven't chosen Jesus as your shepherd. If you're truly honest in your heart, you really haven't been listening to him. Oh, maybe you have other shepherds. And Jesus is getting your attention today and he's inviting you into his sheepfold. He's saying, would you come and trust me? Would you come and follow me? Would you invite him into your life today? All it requires is you to say, Jesus, I choose to trust you. Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I've been going my own way this entire time. And when we go our own way, it's called sin. And we say, Jesus, would you forgive me of that? I choose to follow you. And when you reach out and you say, Jesus, would you forgive me of that? It's forgiven. And he invites you in. Maybe you're here today and you are his sheep, but there's other voices that have been getting your attention. And those voices are louder than the voice of Jesus. Jesus, would you forgive us of that? I think we're all guilty of that. I know I am. That sometimes your voice becomes too quiet in my life and there's other voices that dominate. So Jesus, we repent. And Lord, we choose to listen to your voice. God, more than ever, we need to hear your voice in this world. And we know that you're going to bring us into those good pastures. You're going to bring us beside quiet waters. And you're going to restore our soul. Would you restore our soul? And as I say that, there's some people here today, your soul is broken. You've been going through a journey and it's just broken you. And Jesus wants to bring you beside those quiet waters. He wants to you to bring you to those, those green pastures and he wants to restore your soul. God, I pray that you restore our souls here in 2022. We need you more than ever. We invite you into our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.